about a legendary figure, Ellen Gray, who is a model for designers and architects. 19 years ago, I was living with my family in the south of France, and my husband was called to, to make an assessment of the situation of the villa in Robrum. I went with him, and I was uh, first uh, full of admiration of the site and also the concept of the villa, but at the same time, shock of the situation of the abandon that afterwards perhaps uh, one of the, or all of the participants here can talk about the reason. Um, I went again last year and I have the pleasure and the, the privilege to be guided by Elisabeth Amina, who is here, um, and the change has been extraordinary. In the same trip, I was invited to visit the the museum in Monaco, and it was the exhibition of Casper Agro. Uh, it was just the cherry of the cake, because it was absolutely um, exhilarating. I was haunted by his images, that afterwards you will have the, the occasion to visit it here. And I decided when I came back to talk with the Ivory Press team and uh, contact the artists and organize this exhibition. This is the story and why we have here Casper and his work. Um, we have here with us, you have all of you, the CV, a very short CV of each of the participants, so I, I'm not going to go through it. Um, we have one hour, so we have to take advantage of it. I only would say, Welcome to four of you and Casper, the first. Why, how, and what is your assessment of the work that you have done through the years in the Villa? Why? I think, I think um, the first time I visited uh, E1027, as the Villa is called, uh, was a little after you uh, went. Um, it's about 15 years ago. And I, I wasn't invited. I, jumped the fence, uh, like many other people before and after me, um, because it was closed at the time. It was uh, sort of semi-abandoned. Um, and in a way, I didn't know much about it at this point. Um, of course about I, the villa or about Eileen Gray? Of course I knew about Eileen Gray and about the villa, but um, it was early on in the relationship for me, for my part. And the interest came out of in a way, uh, actually an interest in another early modern house um, in the other side of the world, in Los Angeles, which was built by um, Rudolf Schindler for himself and his wife and another couple. Um, so in a way, a similar story of the first house of an architect for him, herself, um, and a sort of similarly radical, around a similarly radical idea and um, I think what, what happened there was that this house had just gone through restoration and I was very interested in what that restoration had come to present at the end of the day when you came and, uh, and visited. And I, I had sort of gotten to know that E1027 was going to be restored, but how and by whom was unclear at that point. Um, but this fact that this was going to happen was what made me start even thinking about doing something there. And then I actually became, let's say, I think I've, I found out, in fact, that there had already been um, drawn up a plan of how to go about this. And for some reason, this plan was... Um, did not go through. Yeah. Uh, one person who um, is linked to the, sto to, the, to the story and the life story of uh, Ellen Gray is uh, Elizabeth, who is a historian. And if uh, you go there, perhaps you have the luck to have her there to explain you every corner of the villa. 
um, I would like to give us a frame, a frame of the history of the Vida and mainly okay. of Ellinger. Okay. Why she went, she went there? Why have a relationship with your family? Why was the relationship okay. with the owner of the site that afterwards sold or lent the site to the Bessier? <laughs> Uh, I'm so happy to see you again, uh, Elena and Gaspar. And, um, uh, I would like just to explain you the history about me and about the Villa E1027, because it's so important, the per this period in modern art. Um, I started to work in um, Rockabilly Camartin 20 years ago. Uh, because they work for the, the commune of Roquebrune Camartin, the municipality and the tourism office, and I start uh, to guide in the same period uh, to create different tours in, uh, in the Villa 1027 and on the Cabanol Corbusier. But the Villa 1027 we opened just sometimes because uh, it was in very bad condition and we opened for artists, photographers. Sometimes. When I went there, it was full of graffiti, well. it was all destroyed, all yeah. without any kind, it was like a kind of catacombs. No? Voilà, it was impossible to, it was so dangerous to visit yeah, the villa, dangerous. very dangerous for a group. Then we opened just sometimes, but we opened every week the Cabanon Le Corbusier, Les Unités de Camping. So uh, um, for 16 years I work uh, for the municipality of Rockerburn and then um, the major in Rockerburn um, would like to, um, uh, to give the, the, project, the project to the restoration, of course, at an, another organism, an association called Cap Modern. And for this reason, I change my. <laughs> I don't change my job because I made yeah, but the same what thing. What was your link well, with Alan Gray? Well, well, hello. I, uh, my link is so uh, hard. With it's so, uh, I have a passion about this place because my um, family had the piece of land uh, where today you can visit all. Uh, and my great grandmother worked in the villa in 1027. And when I was a child. I heard every, every lunch, every dinner, uh, the people told me the history about Badovici. Uh, my grandmother knew Ellen Gray, but uh, Badovici was the owner in this house. And Badovici came back every, every summer until 1956. And Badovici was an architect? Uh, Badovici was an architect and director for a magazine called Architecture Vivante. Uh, I think that you know the history about Ellen Gray. Ellen Gray born in Ireland and she lived all the time in Paris from 1907 until 1976. She was so old when she died in Paris, 98 years old. Ellen Gray drove with Badovici this house close to the sea, close to the beach, between Monte Carlo and Monton. Uh, when you arrive in this place, it's so magical. Uh, you have nothing around, just the, the, the sea view. Uh, um, and uh, it's a secret place because you have to walk. Uh, you have a path, uh, so long. Um, but the, the, the piece of land, the landscape, is not, not so big. The house is just 120 square meters with two grand floor. Uh, one access, one floor, it's for everybody. Downstairs it just, it's for guests. Uh, and around we have a garden, but the garden is uh, it's not flat. We have different terraces uh, along. Um, after Badovici, Badovici died in, 50, in 56. He don't have a child yet. He had just uh, one uh, sister in Romania, and she was unknown. For this reason, the second owner was another lady, Madame Shelbert, Marie-Louise. And this lady, she spent time holiday. She lived inside until 1984. But before she died, she gave this house at her doctor, Mr. Cagli. Cagli lived, used this house for holiday uh, until 1996. Before, in 1992, this man, he organized a big action sale with the original furniture by Ellen Gray. For this reason, inside, today, you don't have the original removed furniture. You have two, three uh, original and fixed furniture. Just. In 1993, this guy organized another action sale in Monte Carlo by Sotheby's, and then he came back in 1992, 1996. And in August 1996, uh, he called two guys to work in this house, but uh, the owner he never paid the guy. And the two people killed the owner inside. Yes, <laughs> there are a murder in this house. 
So it's a house that when I visited uh, 19 years ago was with a very uh, creepy aura. Okay. I don't know if any of you have visited the villa. You have to uh, go through a very uh, difficult path um, and next to the train. And then you arrive to this tiny place um, next to a restaurant and next to the Camanon of Le Coupesier. Uh, but it's a, a very isolated, a small villa. Um, and uh, it was abandoned and uh, full of very difficult and dramatic uh, history. So to uh, clean away this dramatic history um, is happening in the last five years and it will be open in 1920. So, but now can be visit until October and then from April on. But before we enter in more, I would like to give the, the history and also the, the relationship with Ellen Gray to uh, Marta. Uh, Marta, what is the role of Ellen Gray in the history of the woman uh, as a designer and also as an architect? That's a big question. Well, Marta, Marta, uh, you can read in the in the in the bio that all of you know is the uh, uh, is an architect, is the maker and the director and the real uh, handle and manage the uh, one of the greatest uh, school of architecture in Spain, which is the school of architecture of the Instituto de Empresa in Segovia, a part of being the secretary of the Prisca Prize and, and uh, much more. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think that, um, you know, to say, to tell the whole history of something is, is certainly impossible because it's always being reevaluated. If I had to pull out some very important things that, that I think about Eileen Gray, um, some are very particular to her. Um, it's a woman uh, who is not living in her home country and, and therefore somehow seems to be seeking that freedom of getting away, going to France, where there is a milieu where she can somehow feel better. Um, I think that has to do with the fact that she is a woman. Maybe it has to do with her history in, in Ireland or what the society was like there. It also has to do uh, with the fact of her um, bisexuality, that I think she needed a place where she could feel freer to develop herself. The, the great thing about Paris was, I also think, was the community that surrounded her of painters, sculptors, designers, architects. And I can only imagine that it was a very, there were lots of very rich discussions. There has been research about which uh, salons did she go to or didn't go to. But in any case, that whole atmosphere would have, would have um, given her a lot of information, uh, points of reference and, and a mirror in which to see herself and, and other people. Clearly, she knew about um, um, modern architecture. She, was, she knew about what was going on. In her own architecture, I think what is so relevant is that she knew, uh, obviously, of Le Corbusier's principles. You can see them in, in the house by the sea. But her emphasis was on the feeling, the experience. And as I was reading texts uh, about her and, and thinking about it, it almost seemed to me to be very related to contemporary architects, um, people who maybe Yohani Palazma says uh, to see with your skin. Um, so she was looking for an architecture that was not pure from the point of view of canons, but was providing a human experience in the way that she she interpreted it. Clearly, in interior uh, design, she's one of the greats uh, of the 20th century. Um, and so on a personal level, I would say those are maybe the areas we could look to and shine a light on. When it comes to her importance in the history of women, um, I think it still is an open, an open book, so to speak. Um, her experience reflects that of many, many women. 
that, as Elena, as you said, just in the past years, we're looking at Eileen Gray when she was at the height of her career. There wasn't this discussion, uh, widespread discussion or publication. Um, her partner for a while, uh, Badovici, did publish her work um, in, in Holland. There was interest in her work, but certainly it wasn't the publicity or the echo that so many people felt. And this, again, represents the situation that we have today. Um, I think if we look at texts written about her, you know, they, they talk about her age, they talk about she only did two houses. She only built two houses, but she did many others that were not realized. They haven't gotten the attention. She's, her work is often attributed to her with another, with Badovici, who was 12 years her junior. And then there's always, she's always spoken of in relation to Le Corbusier. Alberto, Alberto Campobaeza is, is a professor of architecture at the Politecnico in Madrid. And I would like to ask you, Alberto, what is your point of view as an expert in, architect, in architecture, as an architect of what uh, Alan Green produced in her life? I want your view here. Yeah, here. The piece is uh, wonderful. It's a key piece in the history of the architecture. Uh, is the queen of modernism, as I hear uh, from some... I think it's a key piece, no more. Eh? Because on the one hand, I admire the patience by Casper taking pictures about how the lady... Uh, is like if a lady in the morning, before to go to the shower, to take a shower, she is... And, and he's taking pictures that are very interesting, but mm, very dangerous pieces. They're very dangerous uh, pictures. You know? mm, when I was quoting Carmen Espejel, it's because she wrote this book that I, I gave you, and she's making an, an uh, uh, analysis of the piece very deep and very sharp. Um, for example, she said that uh, the, this house is a house with a skeleton more or less symmetric with a collage of uh, pieces. It's a, a mix between collage and classical orthodox uh, skin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's very, very precise and I, I like a lot of hair uh, analysis. So how do you see the, the role of uh, Alan Green in the history of architecture? Yeah, for me, uh, I told you before that for me is uh, mysterious in the same way that I, 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 I have two questions, many questions, but two questions. One, why Casper decide to take these collections pictures? And the other question before Casper is why Le Corbusier decide it's not easy for a master and very exigent and very mm, mm, uh, like Le Corbusier, decided to spend a lot of time living in this house, living and painting. You said seven, seven paintings on the walls. It is, uh, I, I use this expression, he, maybe Le Corbusier, felt in love with this house. I would like to sign this house. Well, he was, uh, I he would was like the to neighbor. Say, this house is by me. He was the neighbor and also when he painted uh, in the house, it was an intrusion in the house when she was not there. Yeah, she was very so, upset. They, they don't so know, maybe you don't know, but I, I discovered with, with uh, studying about this, because this occasion, I didn't know that Aileen, Aileen Ray was upset with this intervention by the police. And she was, oh, why he's uh, trying to to uh, remove my pure piece. Huh? So, uh, yeah, sorry, I would just, just to explain because I think that you, you never visit the house. Although the house, the decoration is like a ship. Everything is white, okay? Ellen Gray, uh, she never come back in this house uh, after 1931-32. We, we don't know exactly. Because she drew another project clo close to Menton, uh, La Villa Templa Paya. 
Okay? Donc, she never come back. The owner was Badovici, don't forget. Et Badovici uh, knows so well Le Corbusier and uh, invited Le Corbusier in 1938, five days. And Le Corbusier, he drew two frescoes in five days. Okay? Then Le Corbusier come back. He wrote a letter at Ellen Gray and he said, Ellen Gray, hi, ah, your house is so beautiful. I spent time holiday inside. He came back, Le Corbusier, in 1939. Uh, thanks to Badovici with Yvonne, the Corbusier, the Corbusier wife, took three weeks, okay? He wrote a letter at Badovici, ah, I would like to spend time holiday inside, I would like to dirty the wall. Je veux salir les murs, in French. Uh, Badovici said, yes, if you want to, you can paint it on the wall. And he drew five more frescoes, okay? Everybody was okay for 10 years, okay? In 1949, after the Second World War, Le Corbusier, he wrote some article on the newspaper in Europe, in the uh, United States, and Eileen Gray uh, yeah, read the articles, and she was so angry with Badovici because n nobody uh, told her the, the, the painting inside. For this reason, it was so furious. Uh, and Badovici uh, was in the middle between the Corbusier and Heiling Gray. He was in a very difficult position, you know. And um, for the reason, the relationship with the, the Badovici was... Uh, uh, Le Corbusier rented the villa again in '49, And then he, he said, Le Corbusier, ah, I would like to come back in Roquebrune, but I don't want to rent again this villa because I have this problem with the frescoes inside. And for this reason, he draw the famous cabanon close to the villa, okay? Donc, uh, um, you have to imagine uh, the, the Badovici is in the middle. Badovici say yes, and then he say no. But for Eileen Gray, this house, um, it's important. You don't have the same spirit with the Corbusier frescoes, okay? Today, thanks to the new restoration, we cover with a panel in wood a frescoes behind um, a bed in the living room because when you arrive inside and you see the frescoes by Le Corbusier, it's terrible. You can see just the frescoes, you don't see the decoration, you don't see the view, okay? Then we cover, the Comité Scientifique decided to cover these frescoes. Well, but I, I, today, I Elise, you can see just three. Yeah, but I think, Elizabeth, oh. uh, when you know the history and Wait. when you visit the villa and you know you uh, the area. love uh, of Le Corbusier for the villa, and for the site where yeah. he has spent all his summers there since he arrived the first time yeah. and with the wife and built the cabanon and died there, yes. in fact, died in the sea in oh. front of the cabanon and the uh, Elingre Villa. He developed a relationship very close with Badovici yeah. and with the family who owned the whole site. Uh, Alan Gray disappeared. And but Alan Gray, Alan Gray uh, uh, left in this house the essence as an architect. That was the essence because the house in Menton, the Perui, they are completely different kind of approach to architecture and also the intervention of her. This one was Alan Green from beginning to the end. From the inside and the outside, okay. from the, the private and the public, with the relationship and with the, the landscape, and the relationship with the life, the relationship the with the structure. Yeah. No, so it can be two. Or, or, or please, and you are going to see the frescoes and the whole intervention in the photos of Casper when you go inside. And I, I, I would like to tell you, you as, as you as an artist, is what uh, Elizabeth said, that the only thing you see when you enter in the living room, when you enter in the space, only are there the, the frescoes and the paintings of Le Courbesier. Or really the architecture, the architecture and, the, and the terraces and the design and the beautiful gems uh, in the wardrobes, in the kitchen, in the way that uh, all the spaces go and flows one into each other. How you see it as, an, as a, how you saw it as an artist, because you live a lot of time there. Mm. Well, of course, you see, when you enter the space, you see everything. You see the, especially at the moments when when I first came, um, you see the work of Gray. You see the the walls, which many people have painted on, not just Le Corbusier. 
Um, as you mentioned, when you first went there, there was a lot of graffiti. The, a lot of the walls were covered in graffiti. That you are going to see in the photos. Um, there were, when I first came, actually I should mention that it was Elisabetta who gave me the key <laughs> the first time I came. Um, I, s I remember finding uh, a little stamp from the doctor's office, the last owner of the house, Dr. Kegi, yeah. and uh, someone had even taken the stamp and stamped his name all over the place, all over the house, on many of the, the built-in pieces of furniture that Gray had designed, and um, which, as you mentioned, he, you know, not many of them were actually left at this point because he sold most of it at auction as soon as he could. Um, but yeah, when you enter the space, the first thing you see is, among the first things you see is definitely the murals of Le Corbusier. Even before entering the house, you also uh, see them from the outside. There are, there are two exterior ones, one by, the, yeah, by each entrance on each floor or level of the house. Curiously, in the Cavanon, you don't have any, inside the Cavanon, you don't have any painting or any uh, mural. No. You have the mural outside in the area of the restaurant, on the, the corridor. In the, in the door but, uh, divided. But not no. inside the, the bedroom and the, and the place where uh, he studied. So he put all his effort in leaving his mark uh, in the house of Ellingham. Do you think, Marta, that it was, this was uh, an intentional act? You think that uh, was just only uh, to contribute to the beauty of the house? Um, I think, Elaine, I think that's a, a really pertinent question. And, and I think maybe the, the, jury is still out, the jury is still out on that decision. Maybe, Elizabeth, that you have the recent research. Um, if you read an article by Beatriz Colomina, uh, it has the word war in the title, and she is convinced that, that this is uh, something intentional by Le Corusier, uh, who um, wanted to demonstrate to a contemporary who somehow used some of his principles or embraced some, but then totally rejected others. This, so in her analysis, this, this is really clearly Le Corbusier um, um, Intention. sh intentionally showing a supremacy by possessing the space. If you read an article by Tim Benton, for example, which is older, um, he talks about, well, Le it's not sure that Le Corbusier and Eileen Gray really knew each other. There's not correspondence between them, the circles that they moved in. Um, you cannot see that they were together in, uh, in the salons, in the discussions. And as a matter of fact, um, when he writes to her later on, he, he doesn't say um, Eileen, he calls her Madame Gray. So there's not this familiarity that he normally had uh, with people who were closer to him. So that leads me to believe that um, it could have been subconscious. Um, also, if we think of Barovici was uh, a writer and had publications and published Le Corbusier, he was much younger than Le Corbusier. So here is a young person with power of the press wanting to be close to Le Corbusier, inviting him to do this. You know, Living with him in the side the whole summer, yeah, so eating together, drinking together. I, I think all of this, yes. you know, indicates to me that um, we, we, just as we have a lot of work to do to understand the house and restoration as Casper's done, in terms of history, um, our history that represents the history of 20th century architecture in a way we all read uh, the same books, we teach this from the same books, we've been doing that for decades, Alberto, decades. Maybe now is the time to start adding some more components, making a little bit more layered, a little bit more complex, this history that we've accepted. And, and I think 
not only the history of the house, but the restoration. And, and I find that also exciting. Um, and what it, how should it be restored? What are the implications of different approaches to restoration? So. And maybe I should jump in here because this is, <laughs> um, this was very much, I think, the starting point for me for doing this, you know, engaging with this whole project was not exactly to try and answer uh, this question, but um, at least to, to look at how do we go about um, a question like this, of the question of representation, um, you know, the norm, I suppose, when you restore a modernist icon as it is, the work of someone important as great was and has become even more um, when there is also the presence of, of, of the other in there. And I think it's a very valid question and it's still somehow something that um, keeps on being negotiated within the project of the restoration. That's, that somehow was something that I learned from doing this work that I could, you know, I could see the sort of negotiations going on in, in the minds of the people involved and in the committees that were engaged um, of how to answer these questions. And we should mention that it, was not, it, it has not just been one administration that has been in charge of this work, it has been three or perhaps four uh, and a half. And um, what I, when I started the work, I really thought as they, as I, as I was told, that this would be a, a three-year-long project. That um, that's how it was projected. Um, but as it turned out, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it's not yet done really. And um, uh, every time a new administration took over, this administration would step in and sort of erase the steps already taken by the, the former administration. So there was, in a way, this strange sort of um, hall of mirrors effect in the photographs that I ended up having taken because um, it really was uh, a question of sort of uh, adding and subtracting layers to this site on an, on an ongoing uh, basis. Yeah, what we are going to see here in your series is the history of how you found it mm. and how in the last 15 years the house have changed and uh, it's going to be open in two years time, one year, one year and a half, so really in the last period that you took the photos. So here we have the possibility to see through all the photos because each one of one for me has a story uh, uh, how that project that Alan Gree that you can find in some of the books that uh, the, like this one and others that we will suggest for you to consult. Uh, we have the plans of Alan Gree, we have the original photos of Alan Gree, and we are going to see how is the last product. It's, it's true, and it's, this is not the panel to talk about. It's a huge controversy about it, but we are not going to enter on that. But, or if you want, you, we can. But uh, always happen with anything that is restored because to respect the different layers of history is uh, an extraordinary, uh, not only difficult for an architect, but also difficult for the different uh, patrons or administration or interest on the, the reality is that the majority of the designs that especially Alan Green did for the house were sold uh, by one of the last owner who didn't respect the, but uh, sti still we have the skeleton, and that is what matters. Oh, do you think in different way, no, Alberto? I, think uh, I agree with all of your comments. Yeah. I would like to, to think that uh, how Le Corbusier was bad, but not so bad. Mm -hmm. And when he, is, he decided to paint uh, the murals, the walls, I think he was um, uh, trying to, uh, to disturb uh, Alien Ray. He was uh, enjoying a lot uh, 
maybe you know uh, the most famous picture by Le Corbusier is Le Corbusier naked painting the walls and uh, if someone is uh, uh, taking a picture like this, like this is because he's enjoying he's enjoying painting this these paintings and when I was uh, thinking about because your reputation uh, some months ago I went to the Barcelona pavilion by Miss van der Rohe and I had many pictures of with this occasion and one more time I was thinking in the same way that the more the most abstract uh, architect uh, of the modern movement like Miss van der Rohe uh, was uh, using marbles and or onyx with uh, drawings like painted walls for the pavilion. The pavilion is the, the most abstract uh, piece. I think maybe something in connection with the paintings by Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier is painting not to to destroy the piece by by Ellie Gray, but like the most natural and enjoyable way to to have a, a best uh, piece, mm -hmm. not to disturb. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's not so complicated. Yeah, I, I, I would like to come back to talk about Alain Gray, our, because if not, we are going to discuss Gray, about Le Courbesier. She, she should be very um, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but Coming back to Alain Gray, uh, Marta and Elizabeth, uh, what is the profile of um, Alain Gray as um, architect on hands. Uh, what, how um, was the history of her in the site? How she lived there? How she uh, developed the design with uh, Badovici? Uh, what kind of memories, anecdotes, or any kind of um, message you want to give us about Alan Gris as a as a designer and architect doing this villa, making this villa? I, I think um, probably specifically for the villa, maybe Elizabeth, you okay. can speak more. Again, maybe I can pull out a couple things about Eileen Gray, and maybe they are related to the villa, or they are related to the villa. Um, I think when we look at the type of work she did, she tried to innovate. She tried to innovate with materials, with textiles. Um, when she had her workshop in store, it was most successful, as I understand, when she, she and her partner were there together. Um, I think that, uh, you know, she probably was stronger when maybe someone was taking care of business and maybe she was taking care of the um, taking care of the innovation, the designs and, and maybe the clients. But the business part seems to be someone else. I think in, in the villa, uh, maybe with uh, Badovici, uh, it's, it's also, uh, we can't say she was the lone author. Uh, because maybe she did get strength from being with her then partner. And um, clearly, to, she, they, she was thinking of a house, I believe, for both of them. And only later when she does her own house, when their relationship breaks down and she does her own house, it's clearly for her. Um, in this relationship, it seems to me, she was probably, um, she had more experience, although um, she was known more as interiors and furniture. She clearly was more experienced. She had very clear ideas. They were very potent ideas as to what she wanted in the house and how she was to get it. Maybe you could talk about the, the windows, the shutters, because the comfort and what she did there was really quite inventive. But then Badovici was the one who wanted to publish it. So, so my reading, and, and I may be totally incorrect, I would love to hear Elisabetta's Elizabeth, uh, opinion. I think that she was clearly a very strong woman, not in the sense that Alberto says, rrr, rrr. no. No, I, I think that those are myths that we invent when there are strong women. We have to, we have to imbue them with some sort of uh, 
angry or aggressive personality, and I think that's nonsense. We don't know. Elizabeth, maybe you know from your research more than I do. But um, I think I, I would like to hear more about the house, because my view is that she was very deep and prof profound in her ideas, very clear. She took a long time to develop them, but, but had a theory, uh, had a philosophy behind it. But maybe being accompanied by someone in different uh, adventures gave her some sort of strength or comfort. I don't know, do you yeah. agree? <laughs> Alors, you, know, you have to imagine when Ellen Gray, she, um, she made this house, uh, she had uh, 50 years old, yeah. okay? Um, Ellen Gray, this time, was a very famous designer, uh, was a very good photographer as well, an artist, but she, uh, she started to, to design, to make some project, but nobody asked a project by Ellen Gray because she was a woman, okay? And, um, and um, Badovici, um, well, are lovers, so the two people are lovers in this time, and Badovici said to Ellen Gray, I know that your dream is to make a house and draw for me this house close to the Côte d'Azur. This is so important because um, you have, um, together the two people are in a very strong relationship in a war because the two people work for different uh, restoration close to um, uh, Avesley in Bourgogne, close, not far from Paris. Um, but this was the first big project for Eileen Gray. But Eileen Gray, um, she don't like the Corbusier architecture. She liked the Mally Stevens style, okay? Rietveld style as well. And the first project by Eileen Gray was without the piloti, the column. Okay, in this house, when you visit today, you can see the facade. It's like a ship, of course, but you have the five points of new architecture. Okay, the free facade, the planet's free, the roof, it's a terrace, panoramic view, and you can see the color. Okay, um, donc 80% is by Ellen Gray, 20% <laughs> is by Badovici. But don't forget, Badovici was an architect. Okay, and he helped Ellen Gray to work. Uh, uh, to draw, sorry, to draw the project and to choose the materials. Uh, the difficult today to restore this house is that for, this, for 1929, Ellen Gray, she chose the good materials, but now we are close to the sea. The house is so close to the sea and the, the restoration is so terrible <laughs> because um, uh, uh, we, uh, we have two choices. Um, okay, the, the restoration, we use the vernacular process but with the new technology, okay? Hello, another thing important, the two people, and we have a relationship between them, the exhibition as well, um, Gasper, the two people wrote a book, okay? This book, if you want to see after, is a special number in Architecture Vivante, and Eileen Gray issued the photo in this house. When you see the exhibition, beautiful exhibition by Gasper Akoy, you can see the same place, Okay, it's okay, it's right. <laughs> uh, then Eileen Gray, she shoot in 1929, okay? With the different, then the life, the, the life about the house uh, became so complicated after because some squatter live inside and destroyed whole, okay? But the position, when you see the, the photo by uh, Gasper and the photo by Eileen Gray is the same, okay? Um, don't, I think that, um, um, Gasper, you have the same sensibility like Ellen Gray, in my opinion. Uh, and this is for, so important uh, to see the exhibition by Gasper because I work every day in this house. And when I saw the photo by Gasper, I say, wow, I don't remember that the villa was like that. You know, because today you have a very beautiful renovation. Don't, uh, uh, it's so incredible the. the the, the, the life about his house, you know? Right. Um, yeah, you no, no, what I, I, I have to you say, I'm not an architect, too, oui. and I don't understand about architecture. Oui. No, yes, I have the sensibility oui. of a visitor who uh, can feel the light or the space 
which made me feel better. better. Uh, or when, I, when I leave any space, I feel energetic or I feel down. Mm. When I felt, uh, when I went to the, the, first to the villa the first time, and there was a, a, creep, a creepy yeah. energy yeah. around, and it was absolutely destroyed. It was, um, uh, it was under attack of many layers of uh, completely uh, uh, unsensitive uh, uh, inhabitants, some allowed and some not allowed, because it was the, 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 the memories of the two different uh, owners, plus the squatters who lived there for a long time, plus criminals. Uh, so, although that, you could feel that skeleton that you talk about, right. something with a lot of gravitas, with a lot of presence, still was alive there. When I went the last time, that was last year, or last year, last year, year uh, what impressed me immensely, uh, without uh, giving you any judgment about the restoration or the, the, the levels of restoration, is how now you can feel the light, you can feel the space, you can feel the skin of the, uh, of the, of the house, you can, you can smell, you can, you can touch, or you can, uh, you can, you have the genetic memory of the house. Um, uh, you have the DNA of Ellen Gray there. And you sit in the terrace, or you see, or you go upstairs in, in the, the, in the, the, in the ceiling, or you sit to have a coffee, as we did, mm -hmm. in one of the terrace looking at the sea, and you can recreate yourself in your mind how was the vision of Alan mm -hmm. Green. And that is, I think, the, important, uh, the importance of the good buildings, or the good architects, that even uh, uh, a building can pass through a lot of attacks, um, they stay there. It's like human beings, uh, that uh, some of them are survivors and can uh, keep the optimism and the energy to, to continue to fight. I think this building fights, fights for life and fights because it has the energy of Alan Gree there. And I understood more about Alan Gree, a part of his, uh, my, my uh, completely passion for, he, for her designs as a, a furniture or, or, or use of materials that he did, she did during all his life. For me, it was a discovery uh, of Alan Gris as architect that I think is still there in the villa. Um, uh, I think uh, that Alan Gris, uh, I found a lot of uh, uh, comparison, and I discussed with her, with Saha Hadi. Mm, they, they were the kind of woman, not as an architect, it was completely different, but as an attitude of uh, being a fighter and uh, a survivor, mm. and uh, leave a legacy that will stay uh, through different administrations and to different uh, attacks uh, in the in the legacy that you leave. So, um, I would like as a last uh, question to all of you, uh, before we have 10 minutes of any question in, from the public, um, I would like to ask you, do you think that this villa is the, the key work of Ellen Gray? Um, is anybody of here in the public who decide to make a destination and go there because it's a real destination to go there, <laughs> uh, um, uh, they, will, they will get um, uh, a, a, a further knowledge and a deep knowledge about the, uh, the, the personality and the professionality and the sensitiveness and the talent of Alan Greek. You. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that uh, Ellen Gray, when she drew this house, um, well, I, I tell before she was a, she was a dream. So uh, inside you have um, you have you have to imagine you have all the design, fixed furniture, removed furniture. You have the architecture. Um, 
for this reason, when uh, Ellen Gray, she died, she had the 98 years old. And she came back on the Côte d'Azur in 1970, okay? Peter Adam, Adam, the biographer by Ellen Gray, told us that she, she wanted to come back in Rockburn, but when she walked on the pass, she changed the idea and she came back. Because uh, in your mind, Ellen Gray she would like to remember the house like in 1929. Not, not in, nine, in uh, 1976, 74, okay? Um, because, well, you have the frescoes by Le Corbusier inside, of course, but um, because the, the different owner changed the decoration inside. Not all, but changed the decoration, okay? And um, Ellen Gray, of course, she drew two others house after E1027, but it's not the same project, okay? Donc, I think that uh, uh, with this house, uh, Alain Gray was, uh, um, was, was happy, yes, but was, was um, completely, um, how do you say, um, for her was so important as, a, um, was a so, so important project as so, so important for her, this uh, project by, with, with Badovic. I don't know, uh, explain. You are saying that she couldn't confront at the end of her life we to come back to it, because what we are going to see, even with the restoration, is just a mirror. Voilà, exactly. Uh, mm. But very blurred of what it was at her age. Not yeah, at, her, at, at, at her the time. time. Yeah. But at least we have well. the skeleton. Although <laughs> I, always, I always remember there a book, uh, a biography by Steve Russiman, who is very well known, or was very well known, because he was the, the author of the history of the crusade. He wrote a biography about his life, called the From A to Zeta, where uh, she relates to the family, to uh, her his work to his experience based in places that he visited through all his life, from the A to Z. And the conclusion of the biography is never come back to any place that you have visited, that you have good memories. Um, never come back because then your memory from the past will disappear and will be extremely, uh, not only very upsetting, but also will erase uh, part of yourself. Uh, what is your, your last uh, comment about, uh, uh, about Pelling Gray and your experience? Uh, well, first of all, I thought it was a, a beautiful way that you described the, the energy in the house before. Um, I think when I when I set out the work, it, I didn't do that so much to, to bring about that energy again. That was the work that was going on at the house, but um, I sort of, I set out to restore something else, which was the, the portfolio, you could say, um, with its different layers of, um, of the process included. Uh, I've never had the the fortune to visit any of her other um, architectural projects. Um, I think the other house that she built for herself down the coast is privately owned. Um, yeah. um, but so in terms of your question of whether this was the most important work for her um, and for you and for me. <laughs> This is obviously the most important for me, but I'm not, you know, what do I know? I we are going to enjoy it the first time that we'll be uh, exhibited in a private uh, gallery. It has been always in museums, so we are very happy and very honored to have the work of Caspar here. Uh, Alberto. Yeah, for me, uh, there are uh, a, lot, a lot of questions. Uh, maybe a very central question will be uh, what about the modern wine? The modern. I don't understand. The modern wine. The, the wine from an old uh, building is very clear, it's very easy to recognize, it's very capable to touch us, and so on. 
when we are in front, maybe it's a more abstract question, mm -hmm. is uh, when you said that when you visit the last time this uh, uh, E1027 by Aileen Gray was re restored, re restored and uh, was capable to remove you because the light, because the also moved fire, me the first time, eh? and so on. <laughs> but but different way. before, for me, is uh, uh, I am modern. I am is is our is our time. But how is in the same way that when you are maybe to to speak about an example in Madrid, in the last years, many modern buildings maybe not the best, but many of them, has been changed. The facades have been changed. Nobody, nobody protests. Eh? They don't respect, they change the complete facade. And why? What is happening? What it is because uh, I propose, or I with myself, what about the modern wine? What about the modern architecture? If you must conserve exactly the same, because the materials and the way of construction uh, is, uh, uh, is sometimes is weak, is w more weak than an old construction. Mm -hmm. And this is for me a, a question that I have not um, a clear response, answer. answer. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Marta. In this case, and in this case is very clear and is my, I am astonished why this uh, John nice uh, photographer is capable to go ta 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 to have a lot of pictures uh, about this restoration. Oh, it's history. It's uh, interesting but uh, weird, very weird. Marta, and you have the last word before we have one or two questions. Yeah. Um. I don't know whether to answer Alberto or to answer <laughs> Elena. Answer whatever you like. Um, when, Elena, your question, is this a key building uh, by Eileen Gray or for um, modern history, 20th century history, I, I would say yes. It, it is a key building and thank goodness it's not lost. And thank goodness that Casper uh, is, has the photos and more research is being done. I think it's key for, uh, uh, the, for a couple reasons, and I will also give a point of caution. I think it's key just because of the quality of the building, just because of the quality. And I think now we are discovering that people are looking at it and they're not even if they didn't look at the name, it is a magnificent domestic example of 20th century architecture. Um, had it had Le Corbusier's name, people would have studied it more and sooner. So in that sense, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a wonderful uh, moment in our history. Um, I think it's also important because it's a place where Eileen Gray was able to bring together in a very personal way, a lot of her ideas, things that she had been thinking about, she was able to experiment because it was not only interior or texture, but as you said, Elena, it was the facade, it was the structure, it was the space, it was the context. Um, that said, I, my point of caution is I think if we, use this to justify if we use, oh, Eileen Gray's house is the real key, not her furniture, not her interiors. My point of caution is I think we may be missing very important talent in the history of architecture because either the people didn't have the opportunity or because of our culture or because of our traditions push them in other directions. So I would say this is key. It's key because it's her house, um, but it's not key on an objective. It, we shouldn't be confused and say architecture is better than interiors. Buildings are more important than landscape. Um, 
I think we have to, now that we're in the 21st century, we have to understand that architecture has, is expanding and we should evaluate it from a much broader perspective rather than maybe the 19th century or early 20th. The author, the building, that's good. The other activities, the other um, uh, well, areas. In fact, in fact Marta, uh, Alan Green came to, came to the, to the, be in the cover of Le Monde and another newspaper when his, uh, her uh, design of uh, sofa uh, took a prize in the auction in the auction in Sotheby's more than a Picasso several years ago. Um, and when <laughs> so that was uh, the, a call for many 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 uh, historians, for many architects, and and, and for many um, dealers. Uh, and from then, all the prices of uh, Alan Green uh, has been rocket. Um, and uh, have been achieved prices which are much more high than even the villa. Uh, so um, we would like to have one or two questions from the public, if there are any, and then to uh, enjoy the exhibition. Are there any questions in the public? Yeah, we have two questions and that's it. We begin from... <coughs> No, at the end. Hi, uh, just a question maybe Elisabetta or Casper can answer. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened with the house during World War II? And if there are any marks or traces of that, what is going to happen during the restoration? I, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't he hear well from the... Uh, yeah, the Just slower. So the question was what happened to the house during World War II, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. And if there are any traces of World War II or marks, what is going to happen with the restoration, with the marks uh, for the restoration? Yeah. Um, I think my knowledge of that is quite limited. I know from um, historical images that uh, soldiers were using one of Likovic's murals for target practice outside. But in fact, that mural was later removed by um, a local mason who came to do some repair work on the house. Um, according to Beatrice, uh, he probably used to work for, for Gray and um, decided to remove the mural by his own account. But um, maybe you know more about it, it's better. <laughs> uh, in the villa, we don't, we don't want to remove all. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. We, um, we cover just the frescoes. Uh, you have to imagine, um, Le Corbusier, he covered two frescoes after the Second World War, okay? In 1978, an artist called Brognaschi, he covered another painting with the wool, and he made a copy um, under the um, under the villa. Okay, you have the piloti. Okay, uh, outside you have another. We have to imagine another painting by Le Corbusier. But this painting was covered in 1978. Now today, when you visit the villa, you can see just um, three frescoes by Le Corbusier, and one sometimes because we cover with a panel in wood. Okay, and this fresco is a no. Um, Thanks to this restoration, we would like not to cover the painting by Le Corbusier because uh, all is classified historical monument, and um, is the history about this hall, this house. And, and do you know more about the the state of the house during World War Two, which was also the question the during the war, the Second World War? What was uh, what, happened, what was happening you? at the villa ah, at this point? The, the second, uh, uh, why you the, the why the war was covered? No, 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 no. during the, the war, the Second World War. German soldiers were using the house, I believe, no? The second. Ah, during the war, sorry. I just, <laughs> sorry, during the war. What's happened during the war, sorry. Um, during the Second World War, um, the villa, nobody, sorry, nobody lived in this house for five years. 
and uh, the border was between Menton and Roquebrune, and the German soldier crossed the border in 1943. And different, you have to imagine different houses was open um, in this time and um, by the German soldier. And the German soldier stay in the house, E1027, for uh, many days. And the painting by Le Corbusier under the pilotis was completely destroyed because the German soldier shoot on the wall. Uh, in this uh, painting by Le Corbusier, you have three ladies. Um, it was completely destroyed. Alors, Le Badovici, when he came back after the, the Second World War, he restored the villa inside, and he wrote a letter at Le Corbusier, and he said, Le Corbusier, I'm afraid, but your, your painting and in this wall is completely destroyed. But no, mm, Le Corbusier don't, don't touch the painting from, he don't, he don't cover the painting himself. Um, just uh, Brognaschi covered the, the wall because uh, Madame Chalbert uh, called this man to restore the villa, uh, at the painting by Le Corbusier. And this man uh, say at uh, Madame Chalbert, ah, it's better if we cover with another wall this painting and if you want, I draw a copy. The same. Uh, but it's not the same because uh, Le Corbusier draw just with the black lines uh, on the wall and Broniaski he, he made as graffito, okay? You have the same drawing for one, but you don't have the same, uh, it's not the same thing, okay? Alors, two years ago, we broke the wall, okay? Because we would like to find the original uh, painting by Le Corbusier, uh, but it's impossible because the, between um, the original wall and the second wall, uh, you have uh, the concrete, okay? And if you remove all, uh, well, you, you fall down. You cannot see the... Painting so by Le Corbusier. Donc, the committee scientific decided that it was more better to don't touch this wall. And uh, for today, when you visit, you see this wall white. But in original time, the wall was white. Mm -hmm. Donc. Uh, <laughs> the last question. Uh, for, please, uh, Valerie. The question is for Kaspar. Uh, I was interested in what Elena was saying about what this house was creating you emotionally when you were in there. She was describing very well her emotions when she was there. And I was interested in your emotions as an artist when the first time you went there and actually why you took these photos and what did the space without the furniture, no? which is pretty different as what Marta was saying. The house was conceived with architecture and with interior design. And when you went there, it was completely different place. So what was kind of catchy for you to, to do all your research work and your artistic work? Yeah, let's say the, um, of course, to begin with, the house was sort of empty of furniture because all of it had been sold. Um, but there were other things and those little things were leftovers from all the different inhabitants of the house. Uh, very few from grey, obviously, but, um, you know, for me those were important to include as well. So I did, I, whenever I took a photograph, I photographed, let's say, um, the, I had, I sort of tried to assume the same view that grey had had originally, and whatever was in, within view would be included in the photograph. So a lot was left to chance. Then later furniture started appearing. Um, uh, recreated uh, furniture by, I believe, believe Aram, was sort of um, brought into the house since about three years ago or four. When yeah, af yeah, there was a film shot in the house and they brought in furniture to begin with. Um, but also they started to open the house in a sort of off season, uh, you know, on in the season of the summer and placed uh, furniture. So then I would also start to include that furniture in the images, which you can also see here. Um, and uh, let's say then when I, you know, I came back probably four times within this period of, of uh, sort of shifting moments and then the same furniture would disappear again. So then I would take the same photograph without the piece of furniture. Um, 
in terms of what you know, the kind of uh, you know, the sensation of working in the house was always, in a way, what um, something that I, you know, I could feel very strongly how why she built the house and the place just that she did it, and um, as I spent more and more time of it in it, I could also sense I felt uh, very much the scale as to which it was built. It was she was a small woman, I believe, or at least that's what what you feel like when you're in the house, um, and somehow I. Uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed working there, and um, uh, I think one of the one of the last few times I went to photograph um, was the time during the construction in off off uh, season, and one of I was having lunch with the, the the workers who were on site, and one of them started asking, you know, how how long have people been sort of involved with this project? And most people who were there also changed with the different administrations, but um, somehow it turned out I was the only one who had followed it from beginning to end, besides from Elisabetta, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alberto, Marta, Elisabetta, and, and Casper. Um, uh, Ivory Press has published these two booklets where we recopilate all the, the, the works that they are exhibiting there. And uh, uh, we are going to see now the exhibition and also to have a glass of wine to celebrate it. And also I invite you to go to the next space to see the opening today of an exhibition by Felipe Cohen called Broken Light. Um, Brazilian artist, Jan, and similarly, uh, beautiful in the use of material, materials and colors, and um, I think it's a, a very good complement and balance with the work of Casper. I think they have the same kind of uh, attitude that Alan Gray had, which is the respect by uh, the genius Loki, the spirit of the place. Uh, um, that I think is the what you feel when you go to this villa that you can absorb the duende, that we say in Spanish and has no tra translation into English, the duende, the duende of the site. And I think is why she chose with Badovici that space. So welcome here. Thank you very much for being with us. And, and I encourage you to visit the two exhibitions, Felipe Cohen and Casper. Thank you very much, Casper, for your work. Thank you. Thank you.